Women Matters in August 23, and in preparation for our next workshop, which Haneli will give in two weeks, we just talk about the contradiction because Haneli uh, is in Cape Town in a place where the internet is not so good. And she had a, um, a virtual background of the seaside. Maybe you see it now on her stand uh, picture. Uh, and she was frozen. So, and it's not so cold in, in, in Cape Town. So it seemed to be a contradiction. So today we talk a little bit about contradictions after a short, short um, check-in. Uh, Victoria, you want to start? Short, short, not about Beatrice, only about you. <laughs> no. Um, so I don't know why it's, it is a contradiction because I, I was perfectly normal and suddenly had a violent coughing fit. So I don't know what that's about. Um, yeah, just uh, my my check in is speaking of um, the seaside and being frozen. Um, I'm just <clears throat> eternally grateful that I have a swimming pool because um, my health has been deteriorating really fast. Um, I, my arthritis is getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And because of my injury in, in May, when I fell, I still can't play the violin. So I'm getting very anxious that by the time I've, I've healed from the fall, because I still can't use my right arm, I'm wondering if I'll be able to play anyway, because the arthritis is getting so bad in, in the whole, it's the whole body. It's, um, so I, um, I've been sw swimming twice a day in my pool. And um, of course it's gonna get cold soon. I mean, the water, but I'm so grateful. I was just thinking this morning, what a blessing it is because I don't have to, you know, get in the car and go to some pool somewhere. And the ocean's not really good for that kind of thing because it's not, you know, unless, unless you're like, an, you know, a professional swimmer and you can go way out past the waves and, then you can swim for miles, but I'm not that kind of swimmer. So I'm just um, feeling a lot of gratitude that, because um, I go to bed at night and I literally can't move and I'm in, in just excruciating pain. Last night, I thought, I thought I wouldn't be able to sleep. I was in so much pain. And then um, this morning I got up and jumped into the pool and swam. And after like a couple of minutes, I felt normal again. So it's kind of a miracle. So that's my check-in. And I'm not even going to mention Beatrice, so there. And I'm going to pass <laughs> pass it on. Um, well, Hanali, you should do a check in um, if you can. Are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Yeah, I'm okay, here. I'm passing. <laughs> Thank you, Victoria. I love. I also love swimming. I miss my swimming too. When I was in Johannesburg, I swam every day throughout COVID in the winter. It was just wonderful. So I really miss it here because it's not like you say the same swim in the ocean than swim in the pool. And here are not so many pools available like I had there. For me, I'm grateful also to be here with you. I had a lovely workshop last week in Japanese, my first one in Japanese, about living with ease and flow. It was just wonderful. And my beautiful translator and I, we didn't even practice before. She was just so aligned. And we it was like we had this incredible verbal dance between ourselves. And she, like I said, it was completely uh, impromptu. And, and the other ladies who attended it, one of them afterwards said, they've never seen something where everybody was so in something. They were completely in it. So it was really a lovely experience. And I'm bringing that energy here today with us here too. Thank you. And I'm complete and I'll pass on to Gertrude. Yeah, um, Gertraud in the middle of Germany, not of Frankfurt. And um, yeah, from, it's, it's a lot of family. <laughs> so we had two babies here um, for a whole week and their moms, my daughters. And uh, one is going to turn one, the other just did. And yeah, so a little bit family and uh, I had a wonderful workshop for Australians mm -hmm. <laughs> that's an Australian uh, socialpreneur um, company startup 
that we support with Weflow. And, and this was great. Getting up at 5.30 is not so great, but, <laughs> but we did that. And, and we don't have days, but four, four hours so we can match the dates. Yeah, I just, I have my first, my first 10x clients. <laughs> so people keep coming and saying, what do you do? What did you do? So that's nice. That's most of it. What kind of clients? I didn't get that. Or for my my fitness training. Fitness, okay. So it's called 10X. And um, this is a special resistance training, just 15, twice 15 minutes per week. Yeah, it's also for old ladies. <laughs> yeah, that's that's why I did it because I didn't want to go normal to the gym with all the, you know, good looking guys. And so I see there will be the occasion for another workshop here with us in the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I came across a just, how can I say, crazy um, possibility to yeah to support people without ingredients so it's not a medical device but it's it just yeah and they can so wants to know more about it but that's not the place here christine are you going on or, or me um, um i'll go yeah uh, Christine in Carlsbad, California. And uh, <laughs> um, Tom's 70th birthday is coming up. I don't know if I already mentioned that, but he didn't want to do anything for it. So of course I ignored that <laughs> and decided, of course we have to have like a little celebration. So I've invited about a dozen people uh just to come over and now i'm now that it's getting closer it's on september 2nd which is a, a few weeks away and now i'm like why did i do this to myself why do i always do this i i get ambitious and excited and i do like to host things um for entertaining but then as it gets closer i'm like oh now i've got to deal with you know a certain amount of uh anxiety and time and prep but it'll be fun i'm i'm trying to just make sure i can do these things and be realistic and take uh, take as much of the work off myself um, as possible. So looking forward to that. And I've got uh, a house guest coming. Um, her name is uh, Birgit. And I don't know if you met her, Gertrude, at IEC this past year. She's from Germany. And I can't pronounce her last name. So I'm just going to say it. it's Birgit. Vertbach, Vert, Vertelbach, Vertelbach. Did you meet her? I did uh, the last day or so. Yeah, I did. I I know who she is. Yeah. Oh, how come that she? She's comes coming to, to the states. She's coming to the states, uh -huh. and you know, I had told her if you ever come to the states, <laughs> feel free to. And visit. here she is. <laughs> and here she is. So she's coming. Uh, on the 26th and so she'll be here when we meet on the 28th so uh i i assume she will participate and um i was going to ask the group maybe at some point in the future she does intuitive eating and so her thing uh she is integral um so that's good but she does intuitive eating with learning about fasting intermittent fasting and things like that um to help make help help our relationship with food i guess so i'll send something out to you guys you can let me know if you want at some point to hear what she has to say or maybe if she's interested when she sees us on the 28th perhaps she'll join the group which would be great um Similar to her yeah she might remind me remember me okay 
Um, that's about it. We had a little incident with um, my younger daughter. We kind of pissed her off, uh, said something about her. We were watching TV and, and Tom said something about she was talking through the whole thing and we couldn't watch. And she took great offense at that. <laughs> um him silencing her uh during the show and then she like didn't she just disappeared for like a week almost 10 days and so finally had to you know we're trying to coax her out uh to uh resume interacting with us and she just didn't want to and finally um she uh decided to move on and forgive and hopefully forget. I doubt she forgot, but hopefully forgive and move on and realize it wasn't uh, it wasn't a huge insult, just needed her to talk a little bit less. <laughs> Sometimes she's a chatterbox. So that was, I, I didn't sleep well for a number of nights at the beginning while that was going on. It just kind of like permeated my brain. What should we do? Why is she doing this? Da, 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 da. So anyway, that is behind us and now we're on better footing. Um, but she is sensitive to, um, she is sensitive to comments and uh, even things that seem innocuous or obvious, you know, she feels uh, sensitive to those. So just have to keep that in mind. Don't wanna treat her with kid gloves, uh, you know, um, and tiptoe around her, but at the same time, making sure that uh, we consider her feelings. So anyway, glad to get her hugs uh, back, back online. She gives good hugs. <laughs> so that's my check-in and how about you, Heidi? Yeah, my check-in is I last week, I had two concerts. After seven years of not singing at all, I did the, the concerts. It was, I really actually enjoyed it. And I found it also, I was, I can almost say proud of myself because I could let go of the perfectionism. Because, you know, normally I would have said, oh, that went wrong and that went wrong and blah, 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 blah. And I just... It went wrong something, uh, you, uh, Victoria, you would hear this, no? some inconsist inconsistencies in the, <laughs> in the flow of the, of the pieces. But, you know, and also the, the orchestra, it was what it is. It was profess more or less all professional music musicians. But um, first of all, there were two, two rehearsals and that's it. And then, you know, the, the director, if he hasn't, it depends a lot of the director, you know, in the in the phrasing of the music and so on. It, it, it there was no rehearsals in this sense, and only to get through, you know. So it was not a real character. And also, you know, I noticed that after the first rehearsal that I did something really wrong, but nobody told me. I had to figure <laughs> it out myself. So that's not. That's still. Uh, I don't complain about this, but I wanted to say the level uh, gets higher if this the person who is uh, organizing, who is doing this, uh, is able to give the real consistent directions, you know. And so, uh, but I, I actually enjoyed it to do this, so I'm I'm glad about this. And the voice is there. I mean, I wasn't preoccupied at all if the high notes come or if they don't come. It, it just I just sang, you know, and that was a very good uh, experience. So, and I feel also matured in many ways, the voice, you know, because I'm less preoccupied, I guess. And, you know, after seven years and I studied a little bit, I didn't really study all the time, just learned the music. And then between one rehearsal and the next one, there was a week I didn't study at all. So <laughs> I have to confess, I just not so keen on these things anymore and that makes it so much easier <laughs> it was a small concert in in small places you know and the churches were full and the people were happy and i i think i would have been different if it was a big concert hall you know so i would have had more of the old fears but this was the main thing i had in the in the last two weeks 
and uh, yeah, some success story. That's good. And now I feel like wanting to start again a little bit and trying to find out, but not wanting to study and not wanting to organize. So that is a contradiction as we want to talk about contradictions. <laughs> That's my present contradiction. Today I, I uh, sent a message to the oboist and said, do you know the Bach Cantata 199, Mein Herz schwimmt im Blut, which has two very nice arias with, um, with oboe. And I wonder what he will answer. And if, if I try, I can um, suggest maybe to, to do things in some way. So, but I don't want to do the organization. So we will see my contradiction. What contradictions do you live at the moment? Well, I wanted to jump in right away um, because it's about music. Um, so first of all, I'm delighted to hear that you did the two concerts and that they went well and that you enjoyed them. Um, I, I've lived my whole life with a contradiction, which is that I'm I'm a perfectionist to the point of, you know, being legitimately... Um, you know, obsessive compulsive in in certain things, not in everything. Um, so that's my nature. And um, but I I've performed a, a huge, huge, huge repertoire, bigger than than even the you know the really famous violinists. And people have asked me how, you know it would take, you know, years to prepare one concert if you really want to be good. And the, the, you know, the famous level of musicians will, if they add a new piece to their repertoire, they'll usually work on it for a year or a year and a half before they actually perform it in public. And I do it in um, a matter of like months and only usually only one or two rehearsals with my pianist because he, he's so busy. And I realized it was the contradiction you were just mentioning, Heidi, that that if if the main thing is just to do the music and to enjoy it and to give pleasure to the people who come to hear it, and and that's what it's about. It's about you know giving what you have to offer and the people receiving it with gratitude. Um, and you can let go of the perfectionism, then it makes it so much easier, and then you can do more and more more and more and more um because it's um so it's I, I, and i'm not explaining it very well but but the it's it's the contradiction of of in a certain sense having very very high standards in another sense being having giving yourself permission to let them go for the sake of um a cause and giving pleasure to other people and and i've said to people who know me well and who kind of criticize i i know musicians who criticize me for this and say that i you know i'm always unprepared for my concerts cuz they're perfectionists and i say if i waited to, until a piece was perfect by my own standards i would never play the violin ever like i <laughs> i would never have done it at all because even when i'm perfectly prepared i still make mistakes in the performance so it's it's so in a way, the contradiction is sort of the being able to let go of that, um, that quality. Anyway, so that's my share. But anyway, I'm really delighted that you did that, Heidi, and I hope you continue. You know, the other part of this is not only let go from your own uh, um, perfectionism, but also uh, bear that you get um, from from professionals that you get some criticism or oh, that was not right or that before I, <laughs> you know I uh, or, or it is it, enough that somebody doesn't say it was good that was already meant no that was bad and you did a bad job so <laughs> Let go also of this and be happy that people who are not so literal with all their uh, knowledge of how music should be, that these people are happy because they feel the emotional impact of your music and not so much the if you were in time all the time or whatever, you know. So that's a big learning. And also, if I wanted to be perfect, perfect, I would never open the mouth. I mean, that's what it is. <laughs> But it was my whole life, it was a fight. Mm. I had to go anyway, and never enough 
rehearsals because people either you have to pay them a lot of money or they don't have time the ones you don't have to pay so you're always with fear in 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 the, in the performance because it's never rehearsed enough okay over to you two or three because Hanali, I don't see her. I see only the nice beach. So I but sort of forget there. that you are behind the beach. <laughs> oh, dear, I'm this. That's the contradiction. I'm lying on the beach in the sun uh, while I'm here with you too. So I'm in two places at once. <laughs> I was saying with the microphone muted, is this the contradiction or is it not a contradiction lying in the sun and not lying in the sun? Well, Heidi, I think it's the contradiction is, uh, let, me, let me rather shall I say this, that since we've been sharing check-ins, I've noticed a few contradictions about Christine when you said you were so excited about this birthday party and then you became anxious. That's a contradiction. And mm -hmm. uh, even just the sharing between um, Victoria and Gertrude about swimming and resistance training, for me it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a contradiction because for me swimming is a lot more fluid. I know nothing about what you do Gertrude in your resistance training, but it sounds like you know, there is some resistance. <laughs> and for me with water, I'm also in flow when I'm in water. So I've noticed these paradoxes. And when you both were speaking now about being musicians, um, that perfectionism and the natural flow and, and the joy in doing something, uh, which is evident when people watch you. I've just heard about this famous American singer, um, who like in, I think it was Seattle two weeks ago, at her concert, Taylor Swift, they measured that they co-created, the audience and her, co-created an earthquake of 2.3 on the Richter scale. Because people got so excited of, of her being on stage. And it was, if you just think about it, it's, it's incredible, you know, the, the power that we have. But I, I was uh, really fortunate to watch a documentary about her. And there's a huge contradiction because of what you see on the stage and when you see her out privately outside as well. She's actually a very vulnerable person. And that confidence that she says she has on stage is not evident in her daily life. It's just when she's in that position. And that's a huge contradiction. And then her having this ability to co-create with the audience at a concert, uh, earthquake of 2.3 on the Richter scale is for me just quite incredible. And then to see this actually very humble, very internal person then in a private life is just massive. So I think it's just a, a sign of what's happening in our world as well with social media with, and people of that nature that is so public and having that deeply sensed personal life. And for me, it's very similar as well. I love my personal life being very private from me being out there in the world sharing my talents and gifts. Thank you, I'm complete. Thank you, Henley. Hello, Christine. We are talking about contradiction today and the um, workshop of Henley we will do next time at an earlier hour. Okay, so um, contradiction. Christine, I think both Christines need to, <laughs> to speak if they want to. Uh, Christine King, you are muted. I don't know if you want to speak. You have to do something. Here we go. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm so glad to be with us. Um, I'm on vacation with my family in Florida and saving this time for us. So mm -hmm. that feels really good because I've missed, I've missed many of them over these recent months. And um, it's... It's kind of quite wonderful to look out the window and see all the palm trees and stay inside air, air conditioning because it is really hot down here in Florida, like in the hundreds. 
So um, is this a time of quiet for me? Because I've been extremely busy with recreating things on my land and house. Go into details with that because it's all just too, but I, but I finished that before I came here. It's like open and uh, it's a wonderful way to begin the week. Um, I just flew in on the weekend and just wonderful to be here seeing your faces. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So the topic is contradiction. Where is your contradiction in these days? I haven't reflected on that. I think the different, the contradiction would be, I have a beautiful home and seven acres, and there's a part of me ready to go very simply without any responsibility. Mm -hmm. No responsibility, but giving up the regular life there it, there's a pull, a huge pull in my spirit, but I'm doing everything I can to be able to turn the key and walk away or stay. So the choices are gonna be quite available. Does that sound like a contradiction? Feels a like good contradiction, yeah. <laughs> a complete way of living that's different in those two views I see. Yeah, and I and I, I I'm not stressed by it. I'm just lucky to be able to have that, and and to go and to go into whichever it may be. I mean, I could leave the United States. I could come visit you. <laughs> there are lots of choices we begin to be in front of. But right now, I'm in the guest room, and so I look like I'm curled up because I am. It's the only easy place to be plugged in. Okay, contradiction, the other Christine. Um, I was just thinking that, you know, we're talking about performance and ideas and joy. And I guess some of the contradiction I was feeling was for myself, I get an idea about something that I think would be fun and joyful, but then actually doing that thing, whether it's a performance or a party, or buying a gift or whatever it might be, the difference between the joy that I have thinking about it and actually then having to make it uh, come about, make it material, um, then ends up being fraught with, you know, uh, the contradiction of, is it enough? Is it okay? All the self-doubt that can creep in, you know, making sure that the joy gets squeezed away <laughs> from whatever the idea was and it gets infiltrated with these other things. So it's it's always a challenge for me to keep the joy, at least keep an awareness of what I want the joy to be a, a part of whatever that thing is, the performance, the party, the gift giving, the whatever I'm trying to do. So um, the work that I do. So anyway, contradiction between having joy with uh, ideas and possibilities and then the more fraught part of making it real. Yeah. So how can we handle that? How do you um, do I guess for myself, I try to remember, go back to why did I choose this to begin with? <laughs> What is it that I, I, I go back to my values? You know, I try to um, not make the problems or the, the decision making the priority, but my value of I, I wanted to share. That's why I'm doing this. I want, you know, I want to bring other people um, some joy, whatever it is. So, um, yeah. So I think for me, it's just making sure that I remember the values that made me try to implement something to begin with and try to keep that coming, coming back to that in my mind. And so you convince the disagreeing voice of he, who is either too lazy or too, I don't know what, you try to convince it like a child and come on, come on, you do it. You, you want to do it. And now you say you don't want to. You, you are educating yourself, are you? Yeah, yeah. Trying to quiet uh, and 
you know, make less loud the the contradiction to the joy or the pleasure of whatever the event's going to be. So, I, I mean, an example is um, my girlfriend's daughter was getting married. And so, you know, we had talked about it and she, you know, had some, you know, as weddings are, they're complicated events. Uh, they're joyful, but they're complicated. And I bought her a, a gift and it was a simple gift. It was for a mother of the bride gift. But then once I bought it, it's like all these doubts started creeping in and um, it was taking away my joy of having the gift for her. Long story short, it turned out great. She, she loved it. And all my misgivings were just stuff I made up. So I have to, again, kind of keep that, uh, that part in the background, I know it's going to come out and come forward. That's kind of just part of who I am, um, part of who most of us are, you know, those doubts creep in. But um, that was an example of something joyful that I really wanted to do for her. But I, in order to stick with the joy and the pleasure, I really had to make sure that I wasn't second guessing myself too much. Yeah. And she loved the gift so much, she went out and got something similar for her daughter, the bride, <laughs> and mother of the groom. So obviously it was a hit because uh, she ended up sharing that that same idea with other people. So that was nice. Yeah. I'm done. I can resonate. <clears throat> Sorry, I can resonate with that pretty well. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, while you were talking, Christine, uh, it was like I was thinking of Marianne Williams or the speech of uh, Mandela, like um, the second guessing is like we want to hide our light <laughs> under the <laughs> uh, and not put it out there. And I have that with social media to to go out and and post and be visible and and all this. And I want people to know about appreciative inquiry. I want people to have a better life. I want to have people that they know that I can support them or there is something like whatever that might be, Leafla or AI or whatever and and then I don't do it because of that second guessing fearful shyness whatever and yeah that reminds me of that quote uh that we are more afraid of our greatness than of our miss whatever <laughs> yeah so yeah, we can either uh, rather be with what's not working in us than to be happy and proud and open with what's really, really good. And I really want to have people know it. So. I find that's, one, what, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Gotcha. That's it. No, I said that's a contradiction. Yeah. Because I, it's not, not what I actually one but what i dared to do or what i yeah. so well, it's I a, another uh, example than than what you just said but uh that's my contradiction i've always wondered what that um what that means it's i mean sometimes called uh, fear of success i mean there's the fear of failure which is obvious and I think everybody has it. And then there's the so-called fear of success, but I'm not a, I don't know if that's just like a, a pop psychology term or if it's, oh, imposter syndrome, right? Yeah, imposter syndrome. I understand the imposter syndrome, but isn't that di different than fear of success? I don't know, Christine, you're our, um, you're our uh, resident psychologist. <laughs> Maybe you can unpack it for us. I don't know. I'd have to. I'd have to think about that. Um, 
I, I think they're a little bit different because imposter feels like, you, you know, it's that perfectionism. I'm, am I really ready for this? It's more of a, of a readiness in a way. Um, am I, and women, as we know, women tend to feel like they've got to be 120% on top of things to feel like they're capable and they're going to be good at something. Um, men, you know, they're more like at 50, 50 or 50, 55, 45, if they feel <laughs> like more confident than not, they just feel like they're ready. They, I, I forget what all the studies are about the difference between men and women and when they feel ready to be, to lead and to be in the forefront, but men have a much lower percentage of how, how they see themselves being experts and being, you know, I'm. it's good enough. And women, we have to go over the top in order to feel good enough. Um, and I think fear of success, I don't know, I'd have to think about that in terms of, you know, again, that's probably more of really being seen, you know, seen for who we, we really are. And I put that quote, the Marianne Williamson quote in the chat. And yeah, it's a terrific, terrific quote. Can you read it so the people who are listening can hear it too? Sure. Uh, this was Marianne Williamson. I'm not sure. I guess it's her original quote. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? So something to yeah. think about, those contradictions. Yeah, Mandela um, took that quote in his uh, uh, first speech as a president. Yeah. Oh, no, it, it must be Mandela then, and not Marianne Williamson must have taken it from Mandela. No. No? No, he quoted her. It's her, it's her, yeah. So everybody knows it from Mandela, but he quoted her. Huh. I think that whole quote is like a contradiction because we do think of the darkness, you know, the the less than why aren't we enough? And the quote really suggests the contradiction of perhaps we just, again, more like Victoria said, fear of success. You know, what if we are outstanding and uh people see us uh, in all of that, in all the success, then what? Um, and why Why do we hesitate to try to be that? Mm -hmm. For me, immediately came this idea. When you are successful, then you have an obligation to be it all the time. And then it becomes like, <gasps> you know, frightening. Because, and now what? How can I keep up this level? And so on. And so it's better never to show what you what you can do because other people then want you to do it. I mean, this was actually what my grandmother always said. It's better not to show that she knows what in, in the household she knows uh, what to do because otherwise my mother would have asked her to do it. So something like this. You know? <laughs> it's true, so, it brings responsibility. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then you think you might not be up on the on this level. It might have been a, a one-time graceful event, you know, and then you have to do it all the time. And then I'm quite sure when you enter into this mindset, you won't be as good as that time anymore because it will bring you down, no? So. Well, there's a terrible... Um thing that happens to has happened to many many um famous writers and um mostly writers but i think also filmmakers it's it just across the board in the arts where they have they have one really amazing success that's just off the charts and becomes something that you know lasts for you know for eternity but they that's it it's like they had one song to sing <laughs> or whatever and and the pressure of having um, 
I mean, I met one of those authors and she became an alcoholic because her publisher, she was such a huge hit, her first book that, no, it wasn't her first book. That's the other problem. They they published things she'd written before to kind of sat, try to satisfy the audience and nothing was as good as this particular work. And she actually became an alcoholic because she the, the the strain was overwhelming for her. And what can you do? It's like inspiration hits, but it's like lightning striking twice. For some people, it's not, you know, that's it. And um, it's devastating. Christina, no. I'm sorry, I see that you put off your... Yeah, I've got, you're asking me this, Christine, because I have a question. Yeah. I've been settling with this, as, and it's intriguing me that a generalization about the imposter syndrome would probably look very different with each of the nine Enneagram points. Yeah. We would do it very differently. For example, um, I'm a three, and when I'm in my worst case, I will, I will try and hide myself in a deceitful way so that you won't see that I'm an imposter. I'm cap capable of doing that. Or a type one would feel very differently, always wanting to be right and, and um, do the right thing so far, pushing them so far that then they feel horrible if they have not done the right thing and then they blame themselves. So I think they're very interesting ways. And twos do it in a fashion that I, some of my clients that do it by always just being, being so kind and nice to everybody that they won't have to feel that they're an imposter. So I think there are many, many ways of manifesting it. Making generalizations about a large group of women or men, I think is, has its place, but it maybe has, if we ask these other questions, we might go down different paths. That makes any sense it makes a lot of sense and would you like to continue you you said three uh, and yeah, i wanted to ask <laughs> that. What, <laughs> what, what was the question i started with the three and i mentioned the two and the one and the one and now we have still four five six seven eight nine okay so the nine four. i i i insist <laughs> <laughs> The imposter yeah. in, in four, for instance, that's me. Oh, yeah, we don't have to do all of them, but whatever you request. The four wants their um, feelings to be honored and respected and space given them to just show who they are authentically. And when they're in a setting where others are not appreciating your authenticity, they're not validating it, they're not encouraging it, then what we do sometimes is yeah, so. Down. <laughs> down. And, and then ultimately closing down is so painful for us to do, especially as a four, then I might have stories about the other person, mm -hmm. unconscious stories about them, because they're the ones that cause me to close myself down. Okay, and when I'm the imposter, because often I think if people knew that I'm a fraud, they wouldn't even listen to me, you know. Is right. this the imposter thing in, of a four? I think it's, it has many faces because fours are very complex emotionally. Mm -hmm. And so they would manifest that in a variety of ways that are making you, helping you hide who you really are. Because if other people don't see me, I'm not gonna show you. There's this, this resistance. You know, my, the stuff inside of me is golden. You don't wanna see it, you won't see it. I mean, there's, okay. there's a tough place there. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah. You're laughing, so there's a resonate a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Other so types? wants to know their type nine sorry nine seven as well please i'm seven, here yeah. seven and nine seven and nine um seven wants to look like everything's always good and optimistic and um and capable of dealing with whatever comes their way. And, um, but staying optimistic. And when they start to drop in and they're no longer op optimistic about themselves or others, they, um, 
they close down and can maybe even feel inadequate, conceivably depression, but wouldn't know how to name it because it was so foreign for them. They, but they, their emotions, their thinking, it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. They can't be bright and shining and um, enjoying life then what they feel is pain. And that's the worst thing for a seven is to feel pain. They will avoid it in all ways. Pain is the worst. Does that help? It does, it does. Now, if you wanna push back on anything, cause I'm trying to take something that would fill up a whole book and do it in mm -hmm. seven sentences, <laughs> but I'm still happy to do it. And you, somebody asked about the nine. What would their imposter symptom be? Um, they wouldn't. They wouldn't want you or anybody else to see. What I really want to do is just lie on the sofa and do nothing. Just leave me alone. But they really don't want to be seen that way. But that's their safe place. Just don't don't pressure me. Don't ask me to do something I don't want to do. And I'm very, actually, I'm very happy with myself on the sofa, reading or doing whatever I'm doing. So don't mess with me about that. And I don't think they'd like to be seen that way, but that's their comfort zone. Under stress, obviously, all of this is under stress. So these are reactions under stress. Okay, that's an important caveat. <laughs> the other number? Yeah. Okay, that's <laughs> something to swallow. <laughs> Push back on any of it because we're just no, I don't. Uh, actually, when I was, um, when was that in the wisdom course in 2008? There was a they, they had a a paper we we should ask uh, answer some questions and one was what is it that other that you think other people want you to do but you actually don't want to and the only word that came to my mind was work <laughs> you don't want to do the work, is that what you're saying? No, I don't think I'm hearing correctly. I understood as she, she doesn't want other people to know that she doesn't like work. That's what I understood, is it right? No, they, they was like, what do you think others want you to do or expect from you and you don't want to? And, and I wrote down work. Mm -hmm. So I, I really was like, I was so fed up with going to Frankfurt early in the morning, getting up at 530 and coming back at half past seven and just putting the kids to bed and waking up in the middle of the night with all my dresses on and, and then the next day again and things like that. So, um, yeah, really to... I can be with myself, yeah, very well. <laughs> so I don't need other people. Um, yeah, I could be on the sofa and just reading or whatever. Well, um, and I think there's a big picture there really is I, I don't, my imposter syndrome with the way I'm responding with mirror, mirroring you a little bit is I don't want to be meeting others' expectations. And work is yeah, I think that's that that so expectation is on the top and work is one of the things under the, under the belly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that resonates most so that I have to do it in a certain way or have to do certain things what others that. expect me to do and for me it doesn't have any value. No. And that could be a, a characteristic of the nine but it could be a characteristic of those who are in the feeling triad who want to please others. Mm -hmm. Two, the three and the four want to please others. So we're, we're susceptible to that as well, but just we manifest it differently. 
Mm -hmm. to interrupt a little bit because Victoria will be going in a short time. What time do you want to know? Oh, well, I, now I'm really confused because I, I um, Christine and I have been through this and originally I thought I was a one and then Christine did this really amazing thing um, at, uh, on uh, this phone this, <laughs> well, we were just on the phone and and it turned out I was a seven from the she just asked me just a, a battery of questions without any preface or anything just you know this and that and and I would just answer the questions off the top of my head without thinking and then at the end we came to the conclusion that I was a seven so that's the same as Hanali but it's funny because for me um Hanali to me is is the is the epitome of a seven, the way I see a seven, that like she's always put together and um happy and joyful. And <laughs> there she is. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> um and I'm I've been afflicted with depression my whole life. So there's a part of me that I think I resonate with that joyful, sort of almost like what I would call like a childlike joy in life. That, I mean, tiny things give me enormous pleasure. Like I get a free pencil at a, some event or something. They're just beyond, you know, ecstasy. But um, but I suffer from major clinical depression. I mean, the real deal. And so so it's a it's. I mean, there's a lot of unpacking. I think I need to do with with that because it's it's there's such a huge contrast between. I, I think my true inner soul is is joyful and and hopefully I mean Hanali is my role model so mm -hmm. <laughs> if I can get there. <laughs> Victoria, what you're touching on, just to, do I, if you have another moment or two to be here. Yeah. Just remember, remember when we were studying at the levels of development, and Hanali may look like a very high functioning seven. The dynamics that we some of us know about that you've had to deal with with your family, your mother, et cetera, et cetera, that would have pulled down some of the joyful qualities of the seven. And you would have had to deal with the stresses that show up at the other levels. Does that make sense? It would explain it. You can go look in the book where it talks about the qualities of healthy, average, and less healthy. Right, right, right. I forgot about that. Yeah, absolutely. Essential to what you're saying. So what you get to do is figure out how to climb that little ladder <laughs> into your soul, your soul that can be very, very healthy. The hell with what's going on around me. My inner world is this. And let go of some of those things that pull you down that you don't that you have no control over, my dear. Mm. I think that's where we can find the the power of your joy. Oh, I love that. That gave me a chill. Thank you for that. Wow. I wish I didn't have to leave. Um, well, we should talk on the phone sometime. <laughs> that no, that was that gave me that literally gave me goosebumps because that's exact you nailed it exactly. Exactly. And you that's were ready I to receive it, my dear. I didn't do anything. You just received what you wanted to hear. I think that's why I, I think that's why I've been studying Buddhism though since the beginning of the pandemic. It's because the whole goal in Buddhism is to um, to let go of all the things you can't control uh -huh. and and to have equanimity in what is and find joy and compassion and love in in everything, regardless of what's going on. Yes. And so there. Yeah, the I perfect. love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank um, you for being ready for that. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, well, I don't want to. Well, I don't. I I want to. Are is it? Is are people going to check out? Because I don't want to miss out. I'll slip away, but I'll stay as long as I can. Oh, somebody already left. Was that Hanali? Mm -hmm. um, she might have left for internet reasons. You know that might yeah. not be intentionally. <laughs> well, thank you, and um, lots of love to everybody, and see you next time. Hope you feel better. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. And, and um, enjoy Florida, Christine. And remember, it's uh, five fifteen next yeah, time. Yeah, we should we should confirm with an email because for the people mm -hmm. that weren't here. Okay, thank you, everybody. Lots of love. Bye bye. Bye bye. I was just thinking uh, of um, contradictions 
We have little sentences. They are called appreciators of perspectives, and we developed them over 10 years. And one of which is the opposite is also true. Mm -hmm. And and I think to, to hold that, and I remember my my brother, he had twin brothers, twin twins, and one died one week after birth. And um, he, he said, and the other one was completely healthy. And uh, then he said, it's so hard and you can hardly keep it or I, yeah, hold it in your heart, this overwhelming joy for the one and this just amazing, like surmounting grief when you know the other one has to go and and to hold both and and he said that that's really really hard to do so um yeah to 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 be able to hold life in its complexity all complexity and contradictions and everything and and it doesn't mean that one is less true than the other. Yeah, and that means also to we need to give up to want only the good because the good exists only when there is also the bad, you know. So the both ends of 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 the of the stick, let's say a stick wouldn't be a stick if it had only one end. So we forget this uh, very often and the capacity of embrace the whole thing, I think that's a lifelong learning. I cover <laughs> uh, myself all the time that I want only, only this, only towards this. No, I have also to accept, as we said before, to make errors and things like that, you know, and it doesn't, that's the next thing. It doesn't diminish your beingness. It doesn't diminish your quality as a human being if you make Errors, you know, and if other people say, "Oh, that was not good," and we normally, oh, "I'm not good enough," you know, but it's really difficult. Yeah. And I think that's maybe that's the what they say that we are uh, uh, angels in a human experience. No, it's that we need to go through these things and try to reconcile them, not to resolve it, not to go into the only good that. As when you believe in these things that you will do on the other side, and when you are a, a, whatever you call it, celestial being, then you don't have emotions and whatever which are contradicting like this. But we are here to experience these things and find out how to deal with it without getting fighting wars about it because one person thinks they are right and the other is wrong, and vice versa. And then we go into aggressivity Oliver's journey yeah with the egg <laughs> how to mm -hmm. open an egg I, yeah. I love this because I think that what the way the way you were describing it Heidi is that just this wonderful capacity to just when we're really here 100% pre present we can feel the pull both ways let's say and that, that that's the greatest teacher of all that allows us to breathe and be present and see that we have we maybe have a preference and the other is not our preference, but both are doing their dance and I just get to be holding both without judgment. Yeah, I think that's that's the, the important word, judgment without judgment. Because otherwise, if you if there's judgment, you you always down. this is better than the other, and you must not have this and so I would say in 1% of my lifetime, maybe, or maybe 0.5% of my lifetime, I succeed in this. The rest, <laughs> not really. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I think there's just more and more of, I guess, what if we just think of it as the word learning? Mm. That I'm learning and feeling and making choices and they all teach me. And mm -hmm. then we really hold that with the crystal love of, learning, love of learning, then there won't be room for that sneaky old judgment to come in. Yeah, and, and also disappointment oh. and oh. anger and everything, you know, yeah. But if we are passionate about learning, 
and open our hearts to that, then there's no nasty word, room for judgment to come in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think one of the, for me, one of the best things about the Enneagram is that it does look at contradictions and it does help, um, if not explain them, make them acceptable, that we're all full of different wings and, you know, opposites. And uh, I, I love the fact that it helps people look at their own contradictions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be another project to talk again about Enneagram in the future. Next time we do the, the workshop of Hanili, I invite you all for that. And maybe we do a very short check out. We have lost Hanili in mm -hmm. Cape Town. <laughs> Well, I don't have much to say to, to check out, but I look forward to uh, seeing you all again on the 28th and uh, doing Hanalee's, uh, well, she called it a meditation or exercise. We'll see. <laughs> what are your awareness? Uh, awareness practice, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Go, go ahead, Christine. Uh, I'm I think my checkout is about my check-in. I was trying to sign in at at noon, but it didn't work. Was I too early? No, probably too late, but we, we have to check <laughs> out your, time your time zone for next time. Okay. What, time did we, what time did we start? That's my closeout. What time did Today we start? Today we started our time, 5.30, no. but... That is Florida. It's it's still another time zone, so it gets complicated with these time zones. So we figure it out for next time and uh, when you when you need to to come in. Okay. Eleven fifteen for next time. Okay. Eleven fifteen. Fifteen for Californian time. No, no. for East Coast. Uh, I'm, at eight, I'm at 8.15 and I'll be 8.15 in the morning. You'll yeah, be 11.15 in the morning. Well, for some yeah. reason, I'm making myself confused. How late was I? Half an hour late? No, it's not a problem for this recording here. We can discuss it later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll, I will make it easy for myself. You've heard I me. want to tell you that the 11th, I cannot be here. But uh, next time, yes. So, 11th, you mean of September? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Interesting conversation. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's 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 almost the at the core of how to live a life. So, holding what so. <laughs> without jumping into conclusions and judgments and stuff like that. So it felt very core somehow. Yeah, and great to see you. And I was thinking of your book, uh, Christine. I think I love it to have it. <laughs> so you can, you can get it on Amazon mm -hmm. and to pay for the hardback, which is ridiculously expensive according to Amazon so you can get it on Kindle. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, my check out is that I'm very grateful for the learning communities, which we are here and other groups uh, I'm participating in. And yeah, I hope to go on on the way with less obstacles of remembering that it's everything for learning and nothing to be afraid of or angry about, but learning, observing. Sometimes it works, but you know, yeah. Uh, in, how do you say, uh, on the way, in practice. <laughs> yeah. So thank you and we will meet next week. I stop the no, recording. Not next.